the organization as a registered yoga teacher for over 10 years. And I'm a lead trainer for Yoga Works here in Washington, D.C., as well as obviously a teacher of local classes. And really excited to be here joining Jivana and Krista. So thank you for joining and tuning in. Wonderful. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Krista Kuberry. I am Vice President of Standards at Yoga Alliance and also a teacher. I uh, used to teach teacher trainings uh, and also was a professor scholar of yoga as well. So big yoga nerd, um, also taught ethics. And so some of the conversations we're going to have today are uh, incredibly close to my heart. Thank you, Jeevana, for having us. Yeah, thank you both for being here. Um, so what I was hoping we could do is start with a little centering to kind of help me. <laughs> <laughs> it's always useful. Uh, and then I have lot, we have lots to talk about. So why don't we get started if you're, if you don't mind, let's get comfortable wherever you are. You can have the eyes closed or leave them open if you prefer and become aware of the posture. So if you can feel a little more grounded, maybe on the exhale, feel connected to the ground, either the feet on the floor, the seat in a chair. On the inhale, feel some length in the spine. And next exhale, see if you can release a little bit of tension in the shoulders, in the jaw. And be aware of sensations, noticing anything happening in the body. Feeling of the air against the skin, clothing. Sensing inside what's happening with you right now. How are you feeling? What thoughts are in the mind? See if you can step back and be the witness to all of it without judging, allowing it all. And then take a deep inhale and slow exhale. And bring the awareness back, opening the eyes. Wait, what happened? I go. <laughs> <laughs> we missed someone. Oh no. I wonder. Let's see what happened. Looks like she's reconnecting. So, all right. Well, we could get started maybe. She said she can hear us. Oh, that's good. Let me uh, let me try to invite her back on and see if that'll help. If that'll help her. So, um, well, while re while she's reconnecting, um, I again I just want to thank you both for being here and talk a little bit about. Um, oh, you're back. There you are. <laughs> That's all right. like, into my eyes, and I was no longer there. So, <laughs> thank you for having me back. <laughs> I love your little chat. Those of you probably can't see, but on the screen that we're sharing, it says, where am I? I can hear you. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, that was a profound meditation. You you actually left your mind. <laughs> right. Um, well, so I wanted to give a little background about um, accessible yoga and our relationship with Yoga Alliance. I thought that might help, you know, with our community to understand that, um, you know, it used to be, we used to have, uh, I, what's the word? Challenging relationship with Yoga Alliance in the past. Um, you know, we, we let's see, at our first conference in 2015, it really was a hot button issue. Like, what's Yoga Alliance doing around accessibility? There needs to be more. There's a lot of energy and, and frustration. Then in 2016, I think at our conference that year, we actually formed an advocacy team um, led by uh, Virginia Knowlton Marcus, who's a um, disability activist. And she helped me understand how we could really get Yoga Alliance to listen. And that was a previous administration at Yoga Alliance. So everyone should understand that. That was a whole bunch of different people. I know you all know that. Um, anyway, so we did a camp. We had a campaign. We had like a petition and a letter writing campaign and, um, you know, really asking Yoga Alliance to 
to address accessibility and the way that many people who are marginalized are not included in traditional yoga spaces and that Yoga Alliance was in a perfect position to, to do that. Anyway, so for a while there was no movement. I, I tried to meet with the CEO back then and they were really not open to what we were saying, but um, then all of a sudden um, she was gone and they brought in David Lipsius and like he brought in all these new people, which is what, like two years, more than two years ago, I think. Yep, just yeah. about, about just two, two ish, yeah. And, and David really um, kind of brought, you know, just like really changed things up at Yoga Alliance, really brought in like this, like a new team and also um, kind of a new direction from what I could see. Like he wanted to really highlight these issues and um, he got me involved actually, you know, and I, I had meetings with him a lot and and then he left, but he, um, he had brought in Shannon, who's still the CEO. Um, it seemed like there was just this big shift in, in the way that Yoga Alliance is addressing these issues in particular. So I just wondered if you could share maybe a little about that, like your perspective on that, both of you, and also like what Yoga Alliance has been doing the last couple of years around accessibility. Because I feel like there are some things. I mean, Krista, I should say like every couple of months, I basically call you and kind of harass you. <laughs> yeah, we have great chat. It's wonderful. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. What do you, th what do you think? Uh, yeah. Yes, that, um, you know, from my perspective and David Lipsy is coming in. So he is who I spoke with, who who brought me on uh, to Yoga Alliance. And he really was speaking about the amount of change needed and the awareness around issues in yoga that weren't being addressed. And so he was looking at this very holistically and started what became the Standards Review Project. And that was undertaken in 2018 and really looked, at, I mean, widely at the curriculum at accessibility, at equity, at issues of inclusivity, issues of scope of practice and code of conduct. Uh, mm -hmm. There were eight different groups, really, and over a hundred different uh, experts, including Jivana, that that weighed in on that initial round of the standards review project. And then I was brought in, really, um, nearing the end of when they were doing the first working groups, but in in the hopes of continuing this work as thinking about the standards and thinking about how we address issues it needs to be something that's not static because these issues aren't static and we need to continue to hear and learn from and support our community um, and in order to do that we need to be fluid and flexible and we need to be in relationship and conversation and so one of the big pieces or sticking points from from David's perspective and, and the continued work that we're doing at Yoga Alliance is especially around thinking in terms of accessibility and equity and thinking about how we as the platform that we hold are able to help support awareness and understanding that yoga you know, truly is for everybody um, and how we can not only support education but support resources that go towards making sure that we are uh, providing and helping access in all ways um, and have just loved really working with Jivana and other people within the accessibility space in learning and continuing to address that um, I think one of the biggest, and, and then I'll just pass it over because I get chatty, but um, one of the biggest uh, pieces are really the scope of practice and code of conduct and how accessibility were addressed in those. So yeah, if you want to, if you want to uh, weigh in on that as well, Catherine. Yeah. I mean, um, thank you for that. That was a really good summary. And a lot of people have probably heard already about the standards review project and um, Krista provided a really nice highlight of it, but it really was a very thoughtful 18 month endeavor that was very much community driven. So in addition to these working groups, we actually held the largest ever um, respondent yoga survey in the world and it included schools and studios and teachers and members and non-members and even practitioners and non-practitioners to really understand from all perspectives what is important in the yoga space. How do we as an organization help uphold high quality safe and to Krista's point, adding in accessible and equitable yoga. And I think it was incredibly comprehensive um, it took a long time, but it should have taken a long time. It's a serious role that we play in the yoga space. We are a voluntary community, but we are a voluntary community of over 100,000 members globally. And so I think the attention that it got from our leadership, from the board of the directors, and even from the transition from David to Shannon and that continuity should not be lost on everybody who's listening and watching and knows that's a really hard transition to do for a CEO to take the plans that a prior CEO built. Um, but David and Shannon had an incredible partnership together. And the fact that 
it transitioned without a glitch and we were able to accomplish what we did last summer with respect to the 200 announcement and it going into effect um, this February, just a month or two ago, is is really something to give kudos to, quite frankly, to Shannon and, and her ability to continue that vision. Yeah. And actually, I wonder if we could talk a bit about the um, scope of practice and code of conduct. I realize this isn't what people were expecting right now, but I just feel like, you know, I'm so excited about those two things in particular. I feel like that's what I've been waiting for. Like, I think it's so great for yoga teachers to have a scope of practice for the first time. Um, and also to have a, a new, stronger, um, you know, ethical guidelines to really help our profession kind of deal with a lot of problems that we've been having, honestly, and address a lot of issues around equity and accessibility. I wonder if you have any thoughts, Krista, just that you could, I know it's a lot of, there's a lot in there. Maybe we could yeah. add them. Maybe um, if Melanie's, Melanie's on there, um, maybe they can add links to those documents if they can find them, just the, discover practice and um, code of conduct. Yeah, and I just, you know, like to to call out Melanie and Jeevana for both being part of the process of helping us create these documents. So um, as far as the scope of practice and code of conduct, again, undertaken under David's leadership, continued with Shannon's leadership. And really the idea was to create something for the yoga community that not only showed our, uh, responsibility and our accountability, but also our integrity as a profession. And so thinking through these documents, we had over 50 consultants and working groups, task forces, internal groups, external groups, a variety of experts and experiential experts weighing in from multiple places. And the idea was really to create something that created clear guidelines so people know what they can and can't do as a yoga teacher, as well as ideas about how in, from the accessibility space, how we can continue to uh, both uphold the law Are you breaking up? Is the, breaking up? the issue that we are thinking about that. Oh, sorry. You broke up there in the last um, sentence. Okay. Um, I was just saying as far as the accessibility piece, we were really uh, cognizant about making sure that we had those voices when we created those documents, as well as that we were inspirational in the idea that we don't see this as like, okay, meet the base guidelines for making sure people are in your classes, you you provide, you know, access at the ground level, but you're really going. Oh, no. Yeah, so while, while we wait for Krista to reconnect, um, one thing that I'll mention is that the scope of practice and the code of conduct are actually part of this overarching ethical commitment um, that we are asking all of our, our members to make. Um, and so it's not as simple as, oh, there's a code you must abide by it. It truly is a decision point. So our registered yoga teachers graduate countless teachers every year, and then they have an option to join Yoga Alliance or not. In the past, it almost used to just be a, I don't want to say a pass through, but it used to just be like, OK, teacher, if you want to join, you can join. Now there's actually a thought process. It is you have an invitation to join. You can step into this family of schools and teachers who do represent um, this notion of high quality, safety, accessibility and equity. And so the scope and the code together with our position on equity really ladders up into this overarching ethical commitment that is a conscious choice that our teachers and schools make moving forward and hopefully will serve as an indicator to the marketplace, to the general public, the practitioner audience, that if they are seeking a teacher um, who stands for these elements in their communities, they can safely look at our credential and know that that stands for that commitment to to uphold all of this. Krista, you're back. <laughs> not, I don't know. I, I might have to go to a different room in my house, although I have been doing these from this room, so I'm sorry for breaking up and I don't know where you. I last lost you. <laughs> Um, well, I just have one thing I, I really appreciated in the code of conduct was, um, how did you call it? It was like, um, not simply, I think it says, I, I can't remember the wording, I should have had it open here, but it's not about not discriminating, it's about um, active inclusion, I think is what it said. Maybe that was um, yeah. Active inclusion, exactly, yep. And that again, uh, uh, Melanie really was a crucial piece in having that conversation and providing really thoughtful feedback and insight. So they, they were just wonderful and appreciate it, appreciate uh, that we did not have to do this alone and that this was really a community 
uh, engagement oriented focused idea of how we made these decisions and how these documents were created. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of Yoga Alliance. I'm proud of the work. I'm proud of our community for yeah. really creating these boundaries. Do you, I mean, I know we should might move on, but I just have a question about that. How, how do you see like that? Like, do you see it having an impact in terms of like actual changing behavior? I mean, will there be, you know what I mean? Like, is it just a kind of conceptual thing that shifts our understanding of yoga? Or do you think there's like real specific ways that that would change the landscape? I mean, I think it's both theoretical and practical. And if you want to weigh in here, sorry, Catherine, I just jumped in. But um, I think that in terms of the fact that we created these documents, not to live in isolation, but to also be part of continued conversations that we can have with the community and reference points towards the importance of these conversations, the importance of understanding our scope of practice, as well as how we should think ethically and behave ethically, uh, both you know, on the yoga mat, but as yogis ourselves. So um, I, yeah, I see the, the opportunity definitely for practical application as well as awareness and you know, knowledge. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll expand upon that. I mean, I think if we, if we don't help bring them to life, then that's, that's on us, right? I mean, the, there's one thing to create them and to launch them and extend them into the universe, but we do need to actually take them now and, and use it as an opportunity to educate and have a conversation on why is it important and what does it mean? And does everyone understand that? Because it's not just the teachers who are already out there teaching that are abiding by it. It's the teachers that are going to be coming into the fold that will be abiding by it and ensuring that they truly understand the space that they're holding for everybody and understanding the responsibility that comes with that and the confidence, quite frankly, of being able to state what is within their purview as a registered yoga teacher, as a teacher or graduate, and what might not be so that um, there's more clearance and more safety um, for everybody, quite frankly, involved. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I'm, I know it's still quite new and it kind of, I think it got, um, you know, what is the word? Like, we forgot about it very quickly because this crisis happened and with the pandemic and, you know, and I do appreciate um, the work that I see Yoga Alliance doing right now. I mean, it seems like you're very active trying to address that and support teachers right now, which is what we should talk about. But I, I hope that maybe when this has abated that we can go back to that. Cause I feel like those were just launched and I was like so excited about it. I know. Yeah. <laughs> we never really got to talk about it. We launched everything actually on February 27th and yeah. being in the seat that I'm in, our very first message about COVID-19 and the coronavirus itself was on March 4th. So, I mean, it was almost an instantaneous switch over. And I do think it's a disappointment for a lot of reasons. Obviously, the situation in which the world is right now is uncertain and in many ways terrifying and ungrounding. Um, but to your point, um, I think almost more than ever, the ethical commitment and what it stands for and the scope and the code and the accessibility and safety and all of that actually is really critical in this time because yeah. people are seeking relief. People are seeking that sanctuary, that ability to find stability and groundedness in the otherwise situation that we're in. And it actually is that much more important that we as teachers and we as a yoga community remember what is our scope and what is our code and what are we abiding by and honoring. Hmm. Great. Thank you. So can, can you give us a summary of what Yoga Alliance has been doing um, to address COVID? I know that I, I've got gotten emails almost every day, I think. So you've been sending out um, updates to members and it looks like you've been reviewing legislation and kind of summarizing that. And maybe the, we can add those links to this um, chat also, Melanie. Love that. Yeah, that'd be great. Krista, do you want to get started on every, like what your day is like? Sure. Right now? <laughs> yeah, I know. yeah, so it, it really, our first priority right now, while the scope and code are very important and tie in, are really being member support in all the ways that we can during this crisis. And so really thinking about how we can provide resources, education, um, help with, I mean, anything you can think about. And one of the things that we've really taken on is we have daily or, or oftentimes multiple times a day, uh, either education or uh, philosophical or spiritual um, components that are coming on as resources for our members. So we've done webinars. We've also been partner partnering with other organizations. So we did one with the British Wheel of Yoga and Yoga Sports and Science um, on how to learn, how to, how to do online learning. 
We also mm -hmm. did one with uh, Alana Nankin from Breathe for Change. And she did a really interesting one on Zoom and how you can utilize Zoom to create community um, mm -hmm. and how you can use that to, to speak to each other with lots of tools and, and, and tips. Um, we've had conversations. We had one with Matthew Sanford um, on Monday, which feels like forever ago. Um, <laughs> I can't tell if it's like one day or one continuous day, um, yeah. <laughs> but about mental health and really thinking about how we uh, are the microcosm and the macrocosm in this space. So uh, Jafar uh, has also, Jafar Alexander has been talking with us about the kleshas and the koshas and how those are applicable in these times. So, you know, really coming from multiple angles, we also are doing Mondays and Fridays, a community sangha. Um, and that's being done by our head of cross-cultural advancement, Maya Brewer. Um, other than that, we have a wonderful COVID resource guide on our website that uh, hopefully maybe Melanie has that she can, or they can put up as well. And um, we have um, a bulletin and a newsletter that Catherine's team has been feverishly working on um, as we get updates to make sure we get out to membership. Um, we really have, have tried to take as many stances as possible. From the foundation perspective, uh, we were about to roll out a grants program in March, and we have now taken the funds that were going to go to the grants program, and those will be going towards COVID relief for now. Um, and because we recognize the necessity of this being a swift process, we have actually been working with third parties to help with the application process, as well as continuing to have an, an internal group or task force that, that was actually going to be part of the grants program, but is now shifting their direction to help decide um, how those funds can be best allocated. And uh, yeah, so those are just a few things that come to mind okay. off of the top of my head. <laughs> out of the bag a little bit with that last one, but Jeevan, it will be in your yeah. inbox soon. My team right now is actually doing the final edits, but yeah, to, to, to Krista's point, the Yoga Alliance Foundation was so close to launching um, or relaunching actually a grants program and in support of everything that we stand for, the high quality, safe, accessible, equitable yoga. And that is, we're not turning our eyes away from that, but um, we are using, and this will be announced soon, so you guys are hearing it first now, and um, we are going to be actually using 100% of that funding that was earmarked for that purpose to stand up an emergency relief fund for yoga schools and teachers and professionals who um, are quite frankly suffering right now from what's going on. I mean, our industry is transformed overnight um, and we are working as a as the alliance. We are working, as Krista said, with other partners. So the British Wheel of Yoga, we've got actually conversations out there with other alliances across the, the world who are doing great things on the ground as well. And what we're trying to do is is present as much information as we can in as timely of a fashion as possible, organized in ways that will really respond and help direct um, people's attention. So one of the things that will be going live in the next 12 to 24 hours is actually a whole microsite divided, devoted to COVID-19 resources and really segmented based off of some of the bigger buckets. I mean, in, in, a, in a situation like this, you think about health first and what is going on? What do I need to know about the disease? It's spread, where it's tracking, what's going on? And so we're gonna have a whole section obviously on health resources, obviously going to the big agencies like the World Health Organization, the US Centers for Disease and Control, the NIH, um, even trackers of where the disease is globally, where the disease is locally um, in your location, presuming you're in the United States, but from the global resource, you can find where it is and drill down. Then when you think about health, you then segue very almost quickly into financial health. And so what are those things that you really need to know as, a, as an individual to ensure that you are set up for success financially? So a lot of that is what we announced yesterday was trying to dissect everything coming out from the CARES Act and the Family First Act in such a fashion that it tries to compile the information and dissect it and distill it in a way that our members can really get value from it. Then you start to think obviously about the business itself and we are all professionals in yoga in different ways and spaces. and what are some tools that might be necessary in order to keep the profession alive? And a lot of that is transitioning into online, whether you're a school or whether you're a teacher and what does that mean? And how do you still keep, um, how do you still keep income coming in, particularly in a, in a world where a lot of people are giving away yoga for free online. And I think that's a conversation we need to have about um, why is that good and why is that bad? And what might that do to our industry when we come out of all of this? And 
Um, so we're working on trying to compile those voices and those resources. Um, some of it's curated by us, some of it's created by other people, but making sure that we can be a, a resource. And Jeevan, I love what you and others have done with that COVID-19, um, what started as the Google Docs and is now transformed into that web page. I mean, that's a huge resource that we're gonna have front and center on our microsite that we've done. And then of course it gets into self-care and community building. And how do we make sure that we take care of ourselves as individual individuals first? And how do we make sure we're staying connected to our broader community? So we're really looking forward to standing that up. That's gonna house a lot of the information um, that has already gone out in probably a more collated fashion and then continue to add to it on a regular basis. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah the resource guide, uh, yeah, that was started by Amber Carnes, and there's a whole bunch of people that um, you know offered to support and put that together. Um, and I think it's it's still linked to the top of this group, to the Accessible Yoga group. It's uh, an announcement if people are looking for that, or maybe Melanie can add it to the links here as well. Um, but let, I just want to go back for a second. So, um, so you're announcing that there are going to be grants from the foundation. Is it from the foundation then? Um, and is that, can you say anything else about it yet? I mean, is there anything more specific like? I, I can only say that uh, right now we have uh, contracted with Reclamation Ventures as a third party to help us with this process. And we are looking for one or two others to help us with this as well. So um, really trying to, again, think about the immediate need mm -hmm. and um, to be as uh, responsive to that as possible. That's good. Yeah, I had Nicole um, Cardosa, who's the founder of Reclamation Ventures, on yeah. here a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, and I, and actually, yeah, we ha I had a meeting with Yoga Alliance with I don't know what group that was, but we were talking, encouraging them to um, work with her actually, because like she had, I was so amazed with what she did and how quickly she put together an emergency fund. And I mean, I, I realize it's sometimes easier for small organizations to move fast. I mean, I think that's. One of the challenges with you is that you're larger, you know, and it's mm -hmm. harder to do that. But I, I appreciate that um, you'd support her fund. And um, so I guess, well, I guess we'll just wait and see. Will that be on the new website? Is that? Where yeah, so we're sending out the member announcement later today of essentially what we just said, which are um, the details that we have them now. But we did want to make sure that the mm -hmm. membership and the broader yoga community know that we we hear, we understand many of us are out there ourselves and our, our own trainings and classes are impacted and affected. So we're working truly for you, for, for this community. So we wanted to get it out as quickly as we could. And in the next probably two to three weeks, we'll have more details on that. So it will be on both our website as well as this microsite that we're standing up. Thanks. I have so many thoughts in my head. What, what, I wanna go to one point. That is the change you made around um, online training and counting you know, towards full credit Right. Can you talk about that a little bit? And and yeah, also definitely. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So as far as that, I mean, that again was in response to what we were hearing from members and the balance between making sure that people could keep their professions, their livelihoods, pay their mortgage, take care of their families, um, as well as make sure that trainees could still learn and be connected with each other. The idea is that, you know, with social distancing and from a safety perspective, that it's it's not uh, responsible for us to be requiring people to have in-person learning right yeah. now. And because we have done so much research even previously on online learning, including working groups and task forces, and are doing continued research, we recognize that there is efficacy in online learning and it can be done well. And we also realize that you know this is this is people's lives, and so we want to be supportive of rather than. Um, the opposite of that with our membership in response to a global pandemic. Um, so I think, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's really us thinking about how we can be supportive of. And then, as we said, you know, really trying to in that space of recognizing that people are going on online to help with we already have online best practices that came out with the new standards. But beyond that, continuing to have education around how you can do this well, what pedagogy looks like in that space, how you can still, again, be integrative and you can be active and engaged and, and really continue community because, you know, the social distancing thing, and, and I think you've probably all heard this too, but I think it's really pertinent. It's, it's physical distancing, not social distancing. And the ways in which we can continue to be connected to each other, be in community, still be hearing, learning, engaged, 
um, at least for me, and uh, this is a little counter to the meditation thing and, and going inside, but it helps to be engaged with other people and to not be alone, to not spiral. So, yeah. you know, there's lots of different reasons, I think, for that. But first and foremost, really just a response to what the members were asking for and what's going on globally. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're trying to be responsive, as Krista said. So when we first announced the temporary provision, it was it was only for a month. It was from March 13th yeah. to April 13th. And I'd say almost immediately within the next within a week or so later, we extended it to June 30th, understanding a following the trends of, of the disease and how it was spreading so quickly. Um, and B, understanding that it doesn't just impact or didn't just impact the current trainings that were going on at that moment, but rather the ones that were starting in April or in May. And we needed to try to be as responsive as possible to Krista's point to make sure that businesses um, weren't disrupted as, as much as possible. So we're still constantly monitoring that. And we have we actually have a daily task force that meets every morning at 930 um, to be able to check in and monitor what is going on, what are what are the concerns we're hearing from members, what are we hearing from the broader community, and how might we need to make um, any sort of decision or concession to continue to ensure that our members' professions move on. Um, mm -hmm. So it's something that we'll be yeah. monitoring, and it might be that unfortunately we we make another announcement to keep pushing it if we if we have to. Yeah, that's what I guess I was curious about because. You know, just for yeah. me personally, and I think other people who lead trainings, like I, that's that's been the major source of my income, and I'm really struggling with trying to figure out, do I go online because it's a huge time commitment. It is. Uh, yeah, I'm um, sorry, and and with the addition of a four year old, welcome to uh, working right. from home. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Um, that's nice to see him. Um, yeah, just like that. There's a lot of work involved in putting it online. So mm -hmm. it's like, do I have the energy to do that if it's only gonna be till June? So that's something that I'm curious with too. And I had a question someone asked about that, about in terms of like starting, if they were to start a new training now, what would that mean for them? Like, would it, could you start, a th I, don't, I don't get it, understand exactly what they said. If you could start a 300 hour YTT now, would, it, would, that, be, would that work? And I guess I, I'm gonna say yes, that the hours that are done now on can count later as in-person hours. Yeah, so as long as it's, start. you know, you can start it now, but it's to the provision until June, June 30th. And, and then after that, mm -hmm. it would need to go back to what it was. However, we are hearing from the yoga community and I just wanna be super transparent that people are concerned about trainings that they're hoping to already book for June, July, August. And so that's something that we're discussing right now and what the best and most responsible next steps are. So just so everybody knows, we see you, uh, we hear you, and we're as quickly as possible yeah. with responsibility-minded uh, business practices. We are making those decisions as quickly as possible and with as much information as possible. Yeah, and um, just not wearing my Yoga Alliance hat, but wearing my teacher trainer hat, I'm in the middle of a 200 hour right now and we have a seven weekend program. We did three in person and this coming weekend is weekend four. And we've been spending um, every day literally going and looking at how do we transition the curriculum into an online format? How do we make sure that we're still honoring the lessons yet also honoring the environment in which our students are going to be? And it's not going to be perfect. They're not going to have all the props necessarily or all the space necessary. And so how do we work to transition that and, and honor it? And it is, it is a challenge for sure. Um, and that's one of the great reasons why I as a member have so appreciated um, the Alanas of the world and the Haley's of the world who have come on and held conversation of how to do that and how to think about it because it is different. Um, and Shannon and I had an opportunity to talk with Yoga Land, I think it was a week or two ago and Jason Crandall and Andrea Ferretti and um, they definitely shared a lot of, of great tips in terms of how to think about that and blocking out um, shorter chunks of time to be able to bifurcate attention span because it is it is different from holding space in person. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really important thing about teaching online I found is that, um, you know, it's just, well, it's just totally different. I've actually, have, personally, I've, I've almost all my, well, all my trainings have been in person. I have a portion of them online because I think with asana, it's actually when you're workshopping something and do is very much about creativity and exploration. I, I'm i still trying to figure out how to treat that to an online experience where it's kind of a community experience. So people are learning from each other in the group and, um, and from the trainers. So it's hard to, 
it's a it's a different format, you know, when you're online. Usually one sided presentations. It's that like less for and especially for physical practice. I think that's where we're stuck, you know. Yeah, I think that's true. But you know, just from you know, Alana's point, Alana Nunkin, when she was just showing us the Zoom, which I I mean, I've taught classes at university online and did not not particularly prefer it. I really do also enjoy the human to human situation, but she did show how you can create breakout sessions, Jivana and folks um, mm -hmm. from your Zoom so that you have groups of three or four people so that they can be engaged with each other and have conversations and with their cameras on, really can look at each other and see bodies and be able to have some of the more physical conversations that didn't seem possible to even me last week. So, um, you know, I would just, encourage people to to the extent that you can in the ways that you can recognize that at least for the foreseeable future this is our world and so you know looking for resources that are out there and being yeah. able to just not be perfect but you know start yeah that's the biggest thing is i think um particularly now don't be perfect like uh, people are looking for that connection they're right. looking for that solidarity <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly and you know, we have to have as much grace and humility as we ever have, but now more than ever of really honoring that. Oh my God, Krista, that's adorable. <laughs> I don't know about adorable, or, but yeah, here we are. Yeah, no, I, I think um, I'm good with the not being perfect part. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really, yeah. that, that's about a lot of what it yeah. teaches is, you know, um, just embracing humanity and our differences and our challenges. But I, feel like I am very, I have standards regarding the quality of a training and I just don't want to lose that. Mm -hmm. So I just, I'm really struggling myself. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I'm going back to what you said about community. I mean, I think um, it is both and external, I mean, inner practice that by doing that, we connect with other people and we need that community support to go within. So it goes both ways. It's like both directions, right? And so I just, I, is, I think yeah. we're creating community. Yeah, we're creating community online right now a lot. Like our this accessible yoga community group has been amazing for me and many other people just to share about, you know, what's happening and to learn from each other. Um, I feel like that's potentially there through online learning, but I worry about losing that um, in-person connection, which I think all, in life right now yeah but teacher training about teacher training so much and literally dedicated my life to doing it for i mean i don't know how long i've been doing teacher trainings for over 25 years and it's my thing because there's this like group bonding experience that is really hard to replicate i mean i don't know it's, uh, maybe it's possible no, it's it's but, not an easy it's not an easy conversation, but I think yeah. it's just it's a necessity at this moment, you know, when the world we live in. So it's yeah. it's really trying to help each other and do the best that we can with the resources that we have and continue to do better and also not lose the magic of yoga and the in person stuff. So, you know, not saying that that this is not something that everything should just be virtual here on out and we should no longer engage with each other as, you know, humans, I think is would be a terrible shame um, for yoga teacher trainings in all spaces, but that, you know, we also need to to live in, we have to experience what we're experiencing and make the best of it, uh, whatever that may be. <laughs> As you're doing. Real world example. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's yoga right now. Um, flexibility. So there's a question, um, what mm -hmm. YA resources are there for teachers who work in day programs for students with autism? I, I don't know if, I don't know if you can answer that. I mean, it seems, yeah. although it's interesting. Do you have any thoughts about that? I can answer it only from the perspective that, you know, we do have a couple workshops coming up with people that, that work specifically in the therapy spaces. So uh, Carrie Mayorka, our board chair, and Francine Kelly, who is, I believe, a somatics psychotherapist and counselor, uh, are doing a workshop. And then we are also, uh, really excited about this series that's coming up with our director of research, Satvir Khalsa and Kim Weeks. And they'll be following all of the scientific research that's going on, um, whether it's yoga for anxiety, depression. I believe that there's a lot of resources 
in terms of what it might look like to serve a variety of audiences and in those as well. Yeah, so to, to capitalize on that or to follow up on that, we are, we are relaunching very shortly um, our whole yoga efficacy research pages that do, as, as Krista said, go into 21 different categories broken up by three sort of super or mega categories. Um, and there is information on anxiety and depression and special populations like the elderly or for children. And Dr. Kalsa has called all of the um, medical resources out there and really highlighted the best of the best so that we can direct our efforts on what does the biomedical research stay, say in terms of the efficacy of yoga with these different conditions. And they'll be starting next week with their very first online discussions and bringing it to life, starting with anxiety for probably obvious reasons. Um, for those of us who are naturally anxious or just experiencing anxiety given the state of the world right now. So we're really excited about bringing to life a lot of that great research that's out there. I mean, yeah, that, and that, I would just say, you know, to answer that as well, make sure. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I, go ahead. I was just going to say that, you know, just to also, as as always, make sure that you are already probably working with that community or have a relationship or an understanding before you go in to, to spaces like that. And and also, um, it's also still just yoga. So use your yoga as well. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, I have the feeling it's someone who is already doing the work and um, isn't able to write. I don't know what yoga lines can do that necessarily, but I do think our community, I mean, our teachers tend to be working often outside of yoga studios. So I just, for yoga in mind at this moment that, you know, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of yoga teachers aren't working in traditional settings, and their work is also impacted right now. Yeah, and that needs for those teachers and teachers and students. yeah, yeah. You know, we actually I talked about that yesterday with Tyrone Beverly um, a good amount about how you can still be supportive of these communities that are not necessarily studio spaces or you know the elderly, all sorts of populations that are affected. And he had a really great recommendation to reach out to nonprofit organizations, to places that you wouldn't even expect that still are able to give funding to help you still be part of these communities. He said, he mentioned, you know, even making flyers and dropping them off at places where there's social distancing. So a lot of options. Sorry, let me just handle this. Go ahead, Catherine. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, I have a thought about it too. I was thinking about how, um, um, some some teachers who work with um, populations that, have been, that are now, well, many people on lockdown, they're recording classes. I think it was um, um, Carrie Sims who teaches our senior centers um, in Charlotte was telling me that he recorded some of his classes and sent them to the, the person in charge of recreation at the senior center and then they could show them on TV while he was not allowed to come in. He's not allowed to come into that space anymore yeah. physically, but he could. He shared his classes with them just to give them something to do, which I thought was very generous and kind. But I just do feel like there's different issues for, you know, for that population of teacher who, um, yeah, I mean, I know exactly what those are, but it's, it's just good to keep it. Um, I do want to go back to one thing you were the, the research part, I hope that means there'll be some reevaluation of the yoga therapy policy, Krista, because, um, you know, going into the mm -hmm. research thing and looking at like benefits of yoga, I think that makes me question that policy. I feel like it's overbroad. And I know that we've talked about it at length. Um, but I think that if we're going to talk about the healing benefits of yoga, then I think teachers need to be able to talk about that as well in their marketing and in their um, yoga lines profiles. You know. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. It is something that we are looking at. And to be honest, okay. we were planning on addressing right now. However, at this moment, a lot of the resources or most of our time and energy and thoughts are going towards supporting the community during this yeah. particular moment in history. And so know that okay. that is still there, that we are very, um, aware and in progress of looking at that and um you know as soon as as soon as things return to whatever normal is, we are all 
able to turn our attention back towards um, things that are not COVID, uh, that is definitely first and foremost on on one of our radars and agendas. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wonder, like, what do you see? Like, do you see the role of Yoga Lines changing at all um, in the future because of this? It seems like you did gears quickly, and I I really appreciate that. And I wonder, um, yeah, if you've had if you've had time even to reflect on. Like what happens in the next in a few months from now? Um, say that the social distancing is passed, but still, still really suffering, and teachers are out of work. Like, I wonder what else happened. What what support can there be? I mean, not that you would necessarily know, but I'm just curious if you've had any time to reflect on that. Yeah, so I think it's a really great question. And one of the things that the Standards Review Project from way back when, to go full circle to the top of the hour, one of the things that the Standard Review Project highlighted was that there is an eagerness amongst the broader community for us to play a broader role than what we had been playing before. And so while up-leveling our standards and ensuring that they were responsive to modern needs and as Krista highlighted at the very beginning, continue to be iterative and responsive to modern needs, we also needed to step up and, and fill other aspects of a membership association as well. So providing education and providing tools and resources and to some extent anticipating the future and ensuring that we were helping with business modeling and best practices and the curations of conversations across all spectrums. We never expected that a, it was gonna be a global pandemic that kind of pushed us into that area and certainly wouldn't have ever wished for that to have been the case. But um, in terms of answering the question, Jeevan, of how are we evolving? My hope is that this is indicative of Yoga Alliance of the future as well, that we are we are proving to the community, we're proving to ourselves, quite frankly, that we can curate mm -hmm. and create um, conversation and resources and tools and content quite on a, on a regular basis that is timely and that is um, of need, in need by members of our membership and the broader community. Um, we are, we like everybody else are in it. Like, so we're kind of, I don't want to, I don't want to diminish the current state of, of where we are, but it's a bit of a swirl. And I think all of us, all industries, all people are just trying to figure out where the snow globe will lie when everything does start to settle. Cause there will be a time in the next few weeks where it does start to settle a bit and the swirl calms and we're like, okay, this is, this is not normal forever, but it's normal for now. And what do we then need to do? And so yeah. we're attempting to address the current state. And I think you see a lot of that of content being pushed out, but we are actually beginning to have, conversations almost behind the scenes of what does that crystal ball sh show us in the future and how can we make sure that when when we come out of this because we will um, what does that look like what does what are different areas of business modeling what does the profession of yoga look like um, while I think there is definitely a conversation about the benefits of yoga online and particularly teacher training online, that's not going to necessarily go away like that um, yeah. for lack of a phrase that cat's out of the bag. And so how do we then look at a blended model of where it's both in studio and online or how do we look like what is the new future bricks and mortar look like in comparison to the virtual yeah. bricks and mortar. And so I think um, being able to direct attention to that so that when we get to that point in this bell curve, we're able to be just as responsive as we are right now in the middle of it. Chris, I don't know if you have anything to add on that. Yeah, no, I, I just think I would echo in general that, you know, hopefully the, the Yoga Alliance at Yoga Alliance going forward, our future state is truly this one of being a platform for conversations, for education, for resources. And that also, you know, we can be in relationship and in response in ways that we haven't been in the past. And as Catherine said, we're showing it now and so excited to be doing that um, mm -hmm. and to continue to, so. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, I And apparently we need hugs, back, so. <laughs> to go to um, what you said earlier about working with Reclamation Ventures, like I'm really happy to hear that because I know that their, their focus is um, giving emergency grants to teachers from marginalized populations under, they, they call it um, uh, underestimated populations, which I thought was a great term. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think that's, 
that's our community you know i mean that's what accessible yoga really represents and i guess i just would i don't know i would just ask you to consider that forward which i'm sure you are which is that you know yoga lines to me is in a is in a position where um you can make a lot of rule and create the guidelines for all of us and i think the the benefits of that of any kind of bureaucracy if you want to call it you know like that kind of a overarching system is that it's there to protect the 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 underrepresented the one who doesn't have a voice and so i just think um i think i i'm one of the voices that have asked you to step up i mean i think i've really I, i've always wanted yoga Lander. i feel like we need we need those protections that the marketplace is not enough of a protection for us because we end up being um controlled by you know forces and by the the, the best the best um the biggest voices the loudest voices you know like the chains like yoga studio chains or yoga celebrities and i think yoga lines, and the reason i've i've spent a lot of energy trying to work with all of you is that i feel like you're in a position to to represent and and protect um people who don't have that kind of power and that kind of privilege um to speak up and be heard do you know what i mean so i i i, I think it's great that you're taking a bigger mm -hmm. role i'm excited to see the online conversations you're having that you're that you're especially highlighting diverse voices it's really great i mean i've, I've noticed that trend I, I really appreciate that um in the teachers that you're bringing forward to share with the rest of the world i think it's really great um and like working with Re reclamation ventures is another example of that i think so, you know so i really hope that continues also our work we had been we have been working on a project um with the yoga service council with the support from yoga alliance of the evolution of yoga summit um to really highlight those voices to mm -hmm. actually directly address issues areas where you know there hasn't been enough attention and where there needs more um action within the yoga community you know we had, we created the, these four tracks of um, basically racism, consent, cultural appropriation, accessibility. Yeah. And then we had to postpone the event. It was going to be in March. So as you all, as you both know, you're both involved. Yeah. And I mean, we're still right. one of our biggest, I think, yeah. I'm sorry to jump in, but I remember the conversation yeah. that we had with our friends at Yoga Service Council as well. And I think that was one of the biggest um, moments of this coronavirus is real, right? Like we were looking yeah. and we were out. And we were like, is this the most prudent thing to actually encourage people to fly to California and host this event? And it was, um, I think, a really brave decision for all three organizations to come together and make that and how quickly things moved after that in terms of the world in which we're sitting yeah. now. Um, I appreciate that we're all still talking, right? And we, I think we actually have a call tomorrow <laughs> to continue conversations on what is the evolution of the evolution of Yoga Summit. And, um, yeah. I think. I think there's a lot there that can still be um, still be brought to light for sure, just in a different medium. Yeah, I mean, I, I really hope we can continue those conversations and maybe expand. I feel like um, in the, the pandemic has just highlighted other existing problems in the yeah. world. You know, so where there's a lack of access, that's just being highlighted now. Um, where there's inequity highlighted. And so yep. it's yeah. horrific, but in a way, I hope that it helped bring more attention to um, those kinds of inequity that existed before, including within yoga. So even though I, I think this is gonna really put pressure on all of us within the yoga community, I hope it actually can um, help us focus more as well and be clear in, in creating a new system and a new way forward rather than just Re revisit the old way um i think that's what the possibility yeah. is here of, of finding new new ways to 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 teach and practice yes so we're no, almost I think out that's of time. beautifully put and and necessary that we recognize that yeah thank you i just we're almost out of time i just wondered if you had any last comments or anything you want to share with us um 
I'm looking to you, Krista. I don't know. If yeah, you have of course. <laughs> I always have comments. Um, no, I, I would just again uh, want to thank Jivana, thank the accessible yoga community, thank the yoga community in general. Um, while this is a time of a lot of uncertainty and fear, it has been really wonderful and humbling to see how everyone has come together, how people are helping each other with resources, how people are, are as, as much as possible putting together resources just for the sake of, of wanting to help each other. And, and my hope too is beyond the fact that this allows us to be able to create a new paradigm or this may be a paradigm shift you know, in, in how we look at systems and how we look at inequities, but that also it leads to this understanding that you know, we are a global community, that yoga exists everywhere, just like this virus does in nation state borders and all the borders that we have created um, how quickly they they can be broken down if they must, and how we have an opportunity going forward to to really be a global yoga community that works for the betterment of all, um, and and how Yoga Alliance can show up to be a part of that. I'm very um, hopeful and excited for, even though this is not, I don't think anybody's favorite time, and there is there is going to be a lot of hurt and continued um, pain and suffering. Uh, you know, you have a spectrum, so. I think that's that's the only thing I would I'd add and that just, you know, if you need resources, please feel free to go to yogalines.org and we're trying as much as possible to to get those out there to you. Yeah, um, I don't want to be redundant. So everything that Krista said, but um, mm -hmm. uh, the only other thing might be particularly for anyone who is international and possibly tuning in, we'd love to hear from you in terms of any tools, resources, conversations. Um, please email us at info at yogaalliance.org. And you can also find that email address on our webpage. But um, that's probably where we would really, I mean, we want everyone's support in terms of highlighting tools and resources and conversations and people who are really doing good and coming together and would love all of those stories and the ability to platform and share them. Um, but definitely a call out to our international members um, where it's sometimes a little bit more challenging for us to be able to identify those please let us know. Um, we want to be obviously of service to to all of our members and to the whole yoga community and um, know that there's some work that can be done there. So please let us know if we can um, hear yeah. of any story and highlight anything. Yeah, I appreciate that. Actually, we're, we're starting that as well with these conversations. So this Friday, we have a call uh, with teachers from Australia, Japan, and the Philippines yep. um, to check in on them organizing calls also with um, Central and South America and our teachers there and all Europe and the UK. Um, just trying to hear from their experience around the world, what's happening, you know, how are they being, I you know that in some, actually much worse than the US, yep. getting pretty bad here, but um, I think it's, yeah, yeah, it's an opportunity to learn from each other. Um, and I'm gonna be doing one of those um, Yoga Lion Sangha programs. I'm not, I can't remember yeah. the exact date, but <laughs> I appreciate that Maya reached out to me. So good. There Wonderful. Yeah. All right. Thank you both so much for your time. Thanks for being here and all the work that you're doing at Yoga Alliance right now. I really do appreciate the way you've um, stepped up to support us, provide us with information and other other things like money right? and funding. So <laughs> yes, try. Thank you so much. Thank you for the time. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.